Welcome back to Higher Change. We're on chapter 20, Understanding What Drives Us. This is a chapter about motivation. The main point of this lesson is that if we want to be successful in life, then it's important to understand how we're motivated. So in this lesson, you're going to be able to describe the basic process of organizing our tasks. You'll define motivation and the types of motivation. You'll describe theoretical approaches to motivation and how they've changed over time. You'll list important needs that are common to humanity. You'll list Maslow's hierarchy of needs in order. And then you'll identify how motivation affects our diet and eating disorders. We'll list the stages of change, then we'll describe principles behind motivational interviewing. And lastly, you'll be able to discuss the importance of relationships for motivation. Many people oftentimes struggle to get things done or they struggle with procrastination because they're overwhelmed with the things they have to do. So some have suggested methods of organizing your tasks. So David Allen suggests the getting things done method, GTD. And this method involves five stages. First, capturing and collecting all the tasks that you have to do in one place. Then processing and defining what those are then organizing the information into category and refining those, and then get, then reviewing each week what you need to do, and then doing your next actions at the right time and context. Now, that's just one way of getting things done, but we also want to look more deeply at what is what drives us and what keeps us going. So that brings us to the subject of motivation. What is motivation? Motivation is the process by which activities are started, directed, and continued so that the physical or psychological needs or wants are, are met. So there's three parts of this. First of all, motivation gets us to start something. But you also have to need, need the motivation to direct it or maintain it and continue it. Otherwise, you can start something, but a lot of times people don't have the motivation to follow through or to do well. Many people, for example, go to college and they're really motivated to at least enter college, but they don't have the motivation to sustain themselves and to keep going. And so that's where the subject of motivation is very important. You know, some people lose interest or they lose their motivation over time. So you have to think about how do you maintain your motivation too. There's three components of behavior and that it includes for emotion as well as motivation. And there's, I like to think of this as the ABC model. A stands for affect or arousal. B stands for the behavior. And it's usually in a social context, so that's why I lump them together. And C for cognitions. And so this applies to emotions, but also applies to motivation in general. So first of all, there are several different types of motivation. We have, first of all, explicit goals, and uh, we might say we're motivated something f for something explicitly, and that's uh, explicit simply means it's spoken or written, uh, basically articulated. And these tend to be shaped by social norms, rewards, and beliefs about self. These, unfortunately, generally do not energize people. These are not what really motivates people. People might say they believe in something, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be motivated to do it. Really, so these are just goals. They're explicit goals, but they're not necessarily what motivates people. So we're oftentimes more motivated by implicit motives. Implicit motives are relatively stable, unconscious needs. These are what really energize people. If you think about this on a brain, on a brain level, explicit goals are rooted in the cortical brain. These are your now, this is your knowledge or your cognitions, but they're not necessarily what motivates you. Implicit motives are rooted in the subcortical brain. They're rooted at the emotional level. And so that's oftentimes why we have to tap into our emotions. And, the, and so when we talk about motivation, it's usually paired together with the subject of emotions, which we're going to talk about next. There's also intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. What's the difference between the two? Intrinsic motivation is, the, is when an act itself is motivating or internally rewarding. You know, like for example, a lot of us find 
we enjoy certain things that are fun and we will do it just because the act in itself is fun. You know, so um, there's a picture of someone swinging on a swing set. You know, you, you might enjoy something recreational. You might enjoy being with a romantic partner. You know, you might enjoy, um, you know, food. Uh, and so those th- kinds of things can be intrinsically rewarding. Then there is extrinsic motivation. This is when the outcome is separate from the person. That's why it's called extrinsic. This is simply meaning that we're doing something for somebody else or we're doing something for a reward that's not necessarily uh, about the act itself. Now, there's some theories that help us to understand motivation. Our approaches to motivation have changed throughout history, going way back to ancient times. But they have looked, we've oftentimes seen motivation as related to the will, and then has been related to instinct, then drive, there's drive theory, and then lastly, we think about needs. All of these are related to the subject of motivation, and, and our emphasis have changed throughout history. So let's start with the subject of the will. Ancient Greek philosophers described what motivates us. Plato said that humans are motivated impulsively by the body in its appetite, need for competition, and reasoning. So those are three parts of what uh, of a person that this the three things motivate people. And we still see that same theme, the three part theme today, although we might call it different things, but we still believe that there's oftentimes three basic needs that drive people. Aristotle emphasized the will in our choices, which to Aristotle, the will was an immaterial, rational force in our minds. Now, we don't really follow, I mean, while a lot of people talk about willpower and things like that, psychologists typically don't use the concept of will today because there's no immaterial, rational force that is separate from our bodies or separate from our minds. You know, our, our mind is part of our body, as we've talked about before. So we'll talk about how it's shifted. So after that came this idea that we are motivated by basic instincts. And this comes from an evolutionary perspective. In an evolutionary approach, instincts are the biologically determined and innate patterns of behavior that exist in both people and animals that motivates human behavior. For example, sex might be considered a basic instinct. And this approach provides a description, but little in the way of explanation. Another problem with the instinct approach is that it doesn't really explain why people wouldn't do certain things. You know, it just assumes that humans are robots, biologically predetermined by their genes or, or uh, their chemistry. But it doesn't explain why people make choices or they might make choices that are different from what, what might be expected of them. Now, in Freud's drive theory... People have unconscious instinctual needs that drive behavior, and this causes tension until the need is fulfilled. So this is a shift away from the, the instinct approach, and it, it's more of a psychological approach that people that considers that people have drives. They're not necessarily programmed. You're not necessarily programmed to do it, but it's going to be an unconscious need that you have to itch, essentially. So we've moved away from instinct then we, uh, Freud introduced the idea of drives. So Freud's drive reduction theory is a behavioral, it, it tends to be a behavioral learning theory that posits that behavior is reinforced by reduction of the drive. And Freud was the, uh, the person who first introduced the idea of drive, and uh, but it's been used a lot by behaviorists And so in drive reduction theory, a need is a human requirement that is essential for survival. So a need could include food, water, touch, etc. Now, needs lead to psychological tension or an internal drive. And this is from a more of a psychoanalytic perspective, a more psychodynamic one. Uh, Freud originally didn't really talk so much about drives, I believe, until later. And so that's why he was, he just, I think he just introduced the idea. Anyway, so needs lead to psychological tension or internal drives. 
And that creates a physical arousal, such as emotion or, you know, a feeling of hunger that motivates the organism to act. And then fulfilling that need reduces attention and arousal. We've talked about something similar when we talked about the gestalt contact cycle or the, awareness, the, the, the cycle of becoming aware of our needs and then getting those needs met and then withdrawing. And so in, that's applied to contact with our needs or with other people. But that comes from uh, this, it's re- very much related to this drive theory, which came out of psychoanalysis as well. So there's some similarities. But anyway, um, this idea is that needs that needs create psychological tension until they re- the person gets the need fulfilled, which then reduces the tension and arousal. So those drives that involve needs of the body, such as hunger and thirst, are known as primary drives, whereas those drives that are learned through experience or conditioning, such as the need for money or social approval, are, no, are known as acquired secondary drives. And this is, you may recall, we've talked about this in our behavioral learning section. There's a difference between primary reinforcers and secondary reinforcers. It's the same concept that we have drives that are primary and then there's secondary drives that are learned through experience. And they're, they would bring us back to the primary drives that, and, and how they're conditioned or uh, socially, they're associated with something else. Now, all of us have some homeostasis in us. So homeostasis means that we have a tendency to maintain a steady state. So, for example, if we get hungry, then our body goes into an arousal, physical arousal, that tells us we need to get our food so that we can, uh, you know, hung- satiate that hunger or get rid of the hunger and so that we will uh, continue living. Without homeostasis, we wouldn't survive. And so homeostasis is part of that process, that drive reduction theory, that tells us we need to fulfill our basic needs. So there's some psychological needs. We talked about basic physical needs, and we'll continue talking about that, but we also have psychological needs that are common to all people. So that brings us to the subject of needs. McClelland, McClelland's theory of motivation highlights three important psychological needs. First, there's a need for affiliation. This is a desire to have friendly social interactions and relationships. The affiliation basically means relationship. Then there's a need for power. Power could, could be bad, but it could also be good. You know, we all need to have a sense of control over others. And, and that's not necessarily bad. We want to know that we are influenced, uh, we have we have influence on other people, that we impact people. Um, you know, we all want to know that we're, we touch other, other people's lives. Otherwise, if we don't have any, any say, or we don't influence other people, then that's going to give us a sense that we don't matter. Then we also have a need for achievement. This is a strong desire to succeed in achieving one's goals, not only realistic ones, but also challenging ones. We all want to strive for something. You know, we want to know that we can accomplish and achieve something. Our ability to achieve is affected by our view of ourself, particularly whether we have an internal or external locus of control, and whether we believe people are fixed or changeable. So, like I said, there's two things that will help us to know that we can achieve something. First of all, it's our locus of control. Locus of control simply means do we believe that we're victims of our circumstances, or are we masters of our circumstances? Can we can we overcome our circumstances? Or are we simply just passive recipients of what happens to us? So external locus of control says that we are victims of our circumstances and that whatever happens in the world around us, we can't do anything about it. Whereas an internal locus of control says that we have power to change our circumstances in order to rise above our circumstances. And then the other, and if we, if we feel powerless, we may be less likely to do something. On the other hand, if we believe we have hope or that we can do something about our circumstances, then we're more likely to be motivated. I can think about stories about people who chose to rise above their circumstances despite how bleak it felt. 
uh, because and so they chose to have an internal locus of control, meaning that they still have control in their lives. Then there's also the belief about whether other people are fixed or changeable. In other words, do we have hope that other people can change, or do we believe, or, or ourselves, do we believe that we can change, or do we believe that people are always going to be the same way they are, have always been? And this is important because if you believe that people don't change, then there's no reason to try to do anything. There's no reason for you to try to do anything because you can't change. You're always going to be the way you are. And you don't believe that other people are going to respond to you know, your influence or that they can ever change. Is it, why bother to try? And so on the other hand, if we believe that people can change, then we're more likely to, to try and, and to succeed because we know that we can accomplish something if we put our minds to it. So that brings us to the subject of hope. Hope is a very important ingredient for our motivation. Hope is part of this idea that we have an internal locus of control. We can, we can have hope that we can control our circumstances or rise above our circumstances. And also we have hope that we can change or that other people can change. So that uh, it goes back to our optimism, our, our belief that there, that there are there's a potential for a better future. And that's hope. So now there's other additional things that we can talk about as we talk about theories of motivation. There's arousal and arousal theory and incentives. Arousal theory is a theory of motivation in which people are said to have an optimal, i.e. best or ideal level of tension that they seek to maintain by increasing or decreasing stimulation. Too little and too much arousal is problematic. Too much stress on a difficult task could inhibit motivation. So let's think about an example here. If you didn't have any stress in your life, you didn't have any deadlines or a sense of urgency, then you would never get anything done. A lot of times people are motivated by deadlines or uh, a sense of urgency to actually do things. Otherwise, if they think they have all the time in the world, then they wouldn't do anything. And, you know, the reality is that we all have a deadline in this life in the sense that our lives are finite uh, and we only have a short amount of time on this planet. And so, therefore, we all have some urgency to do something with our lives. Otherwise, um, on the other hand, too much stress can paralyze people. It can inhibit motivation because people feel overwhelmed. So you don't want to have too little, and we also don't want to have too much either. A sensation seeker is someone who needs more arousal than the average person. Some of us, especially those of us who procrastinate a lot, tend to rely on a lot of arousal to get us going. We tend to wait until the night before so that we're really stressed out enough to actually get motivated to do something. (laughs) And so those are people who tend to live off of risk-taking and stress and that, uh, that high level of arousal motivates them. Now, there's also things that attract or lure people into action, and those are called incentives. In an incentive approach, behavior is a response to rewards of external stimulus, or the, 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 um, the idea that they will get rewarded, and that's going to give them an incentive to engage in behavior. So this is related to a behavioral approach, basically. Operant conditioning, specifically. Operant conditioning is how behavior, voluntary behavior, is rewarded by uh, reinforcers. So the the thing here to note that is, while it's related to operant conditioning, incentives are given prior to an action, uh, or they're told, I should say, not given, but the the um, the possibility of an incentive is told to the person prior to an action so that they will engage in the behavior and then they will be reinforced. So it's related to operant conditioning except that operant conditioning is typically about how the reinforcer is given after the action whereas an incentive is given prior to the action with the expectation that it will be I mean, they'll be told about it, but that it'll be fulfilled after the action is completed. 
And so the incentive compels people to engage in the behavior. So in contrast to theories that suggest we are pushed into action by internal drives, such as the drive reduction theory of motivation or arousal theory and instinct theory, incentive theory suggests that we are pulled into action by outside incentives. So all the other ones are internal drives. So they're pushed, that we are pushed by our internal drives. Whereas incentive theory suggests that we are pulled into actions by outside incentive. Now it's it's interesting. Would I agree with one or the other? I would say that both uh, have their place. I'm not so quick to throw out the internal drives, whereas I do think that we may be motivated by outside incentives, but I don't think that's enough to explain everything either. So let's talk about humanistic approaches. Humanistic approaches really just go back to that subject of the needs our psychological needs and helps uh, helps us understand how human behavior is motivated by our needs. So whereas incentives are really a behavioral approach, a focus on needs is more consistent with a humanistic approach. A humanistic approach tries to understand how humans have innate goodness in them and that um, you know it, it would reject a deterministic view of uh, behaviorism but it sees that humans have a desire to do good. They have, des- they have innate goodness in them. And they have a desire to strive to fulfill their potential. And Abraham Harold Maslow, who lived in the 1900s, was a psychologist who studied positive qualities in people. Again, that's a humanist. He wanted to look at the positive qualities in people and what motivated important people. Why did people do you know, these noble things. You want to understand what motivated people. So in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Abraham Maslow proposed five different kinds of needs that motivate human behavior, starting with the most fundamental basic level, which is our physiological needs, such as our need for food and shelter, followed by the needs for safety on the second level. So in the pyramid model, the needs at the bottom must be met before the higher needs can motivate. So here's the diagram that illustrates the five different levels. One, two, three, four, five. And at the bottom is the physiological needs. These are like breathing, food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, excretion. All of these are important for our survival, physical survival. The next level is safety. Obviously, we need to have safety and security of our bodies and our employment, resources, family, health, and our property. You know, if you live in a community where there's crime, you're going to be less. You're going to be more focused on your safety than maybe other things. The next step after that, once you have physiological needs and safety needs taken care of, then people are interested in their longing or belonging level and that's that includes friendship family and sexual intimacy would put all those together and obviously you know some people are going to rank those differently but these are a broad category then even higher than that which may be uh, less of a priority but it's not it's i shouldn't say less because it's a higher need but we have to have the the ones beneath that as a foundation first before we can even get to the other ones so the higher need or a later need, you know, however you want to think of it, is the esteem needs. We want to have a sense of self-esteem, confidence, achievement, respect from others. You know, we all want to feel good about ourselves. And lastly, the highest level of uh, needs, according to Maslow, is the need for self-actualization. Self-actualization is where we are being the best we can be. You know, you might think of the old army slogan, be all you can be in the army. You know, that's self-actualization. And so that involves our morality, creativity, spontaneity, problem solving, and growth. All of these are related to our self-actualization, fulfilling what we feel like we, uh, we are, our sense of purpose in our lives and what we are meant to be. So self-actualization is, according to Maslow, the point that is seldom reached at which people have sufficiently satisfied the lower needs and achieved their full human potential. That's why humanists 
of the humanistic movement is oftentimes called the human potential movement. You might have heard that. So that's really about how we can achieve self-actualization. Obviously, you have to have your lower level needs met first. Uh, but ideally, so, you know, we want to feel a sense of self-actualization in our lives. Peak experiences are, according to Maslow, those times in our lives during which self-actualization is temporarily achieved. Now, he would probably say that we're never fully self-actualized, self-actualized at all times. We all have to go revisit our lower level needs at various times in our lives just because of our environments are constantly changing. So we're not going to be, you can never be at the top level all the time. So that's why those, those peak experiences are those times when we do experience self-actualization. Now, another model is the self-determination theory. This is a model of motivation in which three basic needs are seen as necessary to an individual's successful development. And those three needs are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And you could probably see these connected to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, especially toward the top where we have a sense of self-actualization or intimacy, you know, esteem needs, those sorts of things. You can see the connection there. But it's not really dealing with the bottom levels, more of our psychological needs at the top. That's where the focus is. But let's talk about these three things. Autonomy is the need to be in control of one's own behavior or goals, i.e. self-determination. We want to know that we have control over our own lives. If we don't, then we don't have a sense of autonomy and we may feel powerless and hopeless and we may feel it may take us a toll on our self-esteem. We also want to have a sense of competence. This is the need to be able to master challenging tasks of one's lives. Otherwise, we may feel incompetent and that's not a good feeling. We all want to feel that we are able to achieve something and, and do things successfully in life. And then the last main psychological need according to self-determination theory is relatedness. This is the need to feel a relatedness is a need to feel a sense of belonging, intimacy, and security in our relationships with others. Now if we were to compare self-determination theory with McClellan's psychological needs, you could probably see some relationship here. For example, the need for affiliation is very much related to relatedness. That's basically what it is. Uh, now, the other one's not as quite clear, but you could probably see a relationship. Like, for example, the need for power, you know, power to influence other people, uh, may be related to autonomy because, you know, we can't have a sense of power if we don't have a sense of autonomy. And there seems to be a connection there in my experience and research. The last one is a need for achievement. This is very, you know, very connected to our sense of competence. If we're able to achieve our goals or achieve challenging tasks, then we feel a sense of competence. So again, you can see this connection between these three basic needs. And you know, it's interesting going back to the time of Plato. You know, Plato talked about um, you know reasoning, appetite. You know, now I'm not so sure if you see appetite here, but it's interesting how he saw the three basic needs as well. Now, intrinsic, there's also, remember, we talked about intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. I want to revisit that again as we talk about psychological needs. Intrinsic motivation occurs when people act because the act itself is satisfying or rewarding. And extrinsic motivation occurs when people receive an external reward, such as money, for the act. Now, evidence suggests that intrinsic motivation is increased or enhanced, which is the ideal one, right? It's increased or enhanced when a person not only feels competence, but also a sense of autonomy or the knowledge that his or her actions are self-determined rather than controlled by others. And that's one of the reasons why extrinsic rewards, extrinsic motivation sometimes actually backfires because people want to know that they're engaged in something for their own, their own purposes, their own motivation. As soon as as soon as that's compromised by external rewards, then sometimes people feel like they have to do it or they, and they end up doing things begrudgingly. It's actually very interesting. You know, like you can enjoy doing artwork or enjoy doing music, but as, so, as soon as someone starts paying you for it, you might actually feel like you have less power and you might actually resent it. You might actually even hate doing music or art, even though you really enjoy doing it, but because now you have to do it for money, 
you can it can actually backfire and that's been a lot of people's experience so now we've talked about basic psychological needs but there's also some basic physical needs and one of those is hunger one specific area of motivation that's been studied extensively is the motivation to eat also known as hunger hunger is that that motivate that's what drives us to eat and so the hunger drive can actually be divided into physiological as well as social components. Physiologically, insulin and glucagons are hormones secreted by the pancreas to control the levels of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates in the body by reducing the level of glucose in the bloodstream. Areas in the hypothalamus play an important role in regulating eating behavior, perhaps by influencing the specific weight that our bodies try to maintain or our weight set point. If you've ever tried losing weight, for example, uh, you know, like I have, you might find that your body likes a familiar place. And once you try to go below that, it becomes harder and harder. That's because your body has a specific level, the weight set point, that it's, that it's trying to maintain. So when it goes below that, it's going to try and go back to maintain it. And so that's why it may, may be really hard sometimes, once you get past your normal weight, that your body starts screaming and, and crying out for more food. You might feel hungry. Even if you're overweight still, because your body's not used to it, you're trying to maintain its homeostasis. Now, social components of hunger include social cues for when meals are to be eaten. Like, for example, a lot of times people overeat not because they're hungry, but simply because there's some, they're, like they use food to connect with other people socially. For example, when I was younger, I oftentimes was lonely because I lived by myself and I worked by myself and I would go to work and I didn't have a lot of friends near where I lived. And so I would go out to restaurants just to be around people. And food is actually very intimately connected with social settings. We tend to eat with other people. We tend to have meals with other people. And so it's very much associated with social customs. And so that's one of the reasons why people overeat and overindulge a lot of times they do it because they're around other people that are also eating. And so there's some, you know, there's a connect, strong connection. And so meals are also connected to cultural customs. You might think, or you might remember, for example, one of the hardest times people have to lose weight during the year is around Thanksgiving and Christmas time. That's because people are oftentimes engaged in feasting and, and, and eating and eating together. So that's why some, uh, you know, people will say, don't even bother trying to lose weight over Christmas because it's just really hard. You might just try, and one realistic goal might be simply to try to maintain weight during these times, you know, because trying to lose weight when everybody's, um, you know, having these big feasts may be really challenging for some people, especially because of social customs. And lastly, the anticipation of food simply may result in an increased insulin response. So if you expect food, then your body's producing insulin and may make you hungry. Okay, so we talked about hunger. Let's talk about obesity and eating disorders, which are somewhat connected. Obesity is a condition in which the body weight of a person is 20% or more over the ideal body weight for that person's height. The actual percents vary across definitions. So it's important to look at your, you know, like your BMI, your body mass index. But obesity is a major problem associated with eating behaviors. And uh, we've talked about other disorders like anorexia, nervosa, bulimia, um, obesity is a type of eating disorder. Now, stress and metabolism and feelings of shame can contribute to obesity. You know, sometimes people eat because it helps them feel good. It, rela it releases hormones that can help, uh, you know, like dopamine. It helps pick people up, makes them feel good. And so, you know, we have to think about, like, sometimes people will shame people who are, trying to lose weight or trying to gain weight or or whatever it is. People oftentimes shame people because they don't understand the underlying psychological motivations that drive people to eat. You know, there are social reasons. There is uh, physiological processes going on. And if you shame people, it's just going to drive them more back to their food again. So, you know, we want to help people to cope with stress and shame and also to encourage their metabolism. Metabolism is how fast or slow your body burns those calories. 
So if you're if you have a high metabolism, that means you're going to be on thin side because your body is quick quick to uh, burn its food up. On the other hand, if you have a slow metabolism, this is going to be very easy for you to gain weight. And one of the ways you can increase your metabolism is through exercise, but it's you know it's going to take time. Obviously, it doesn't happen overnight. Eating disorders show us that people who are overly concerned with the shape of their bodies have motives to meet certain needs. So this is not necessarily about um, obesity per se, but people who are bulimic or have anorexia nervosa, these people have certain needs, whether it's to be successful or be attractive. And being successful in restricting diet gives people temporary relief from negative emotions. So if they're feeling anxious or they feel upset at themselves, they might restrict their diet so they can feel successful or they might feel better about themselves. And that's setting them up for eating disorder. And that's not healthy. It can actually be dangerous. Now, motivation is very important for behavior, but is there a time, is it possible we may not have enough motivation? Is it possible when motivation is not enough? Well, definitely if we have a physical addiction, for example, or maybe we just have a lack of, um, you know, we have a hard time getting motivated. Now, I would say we always have some motivation. The question is, is that motivation powerful enough? That's perhaps what this headline sh or this heading really should be. Is there a time when our motivation is not strong enough? You know, we always have motivation, but is it? Is there times when that motivation is not strong enough? Well, so that's really, it brings us to the subject of stages of change because when we understand how people change, it helps us to understand that we're always motivated for something. We may just not be motivated in a specific direction that you want to, you explicitly want to go. Like you might have an explicit goal saying, I want to lose weight or I want to get fit, right? That's an explicit goal. But your implicit motive may not be aligned with that. And there could be several reasons for that. So Dr. Uh, John Prochaska and Carlo de Clemente and colleagues developed the trans-theoretical model of change known as the stages of change. Rather than viewing people as lacking motivation, they view people as just simply being on different stages of readiness for change. So this is really about stages of readiness for change. And so again, rather than seeing people as lacking motivation, everybody has motivation. The question is, where are they on that uh, readiness for change process? So here's the stages of change or the readiness for change. First stage, and this is a cycle, so it would you know we can come back to this again and again. But the first point in this process is pre-contemplation. Pre-contemplation is when people are unaware of a need for change. You know they might be motivated, but if they are only aware of a problem, so that's why consciousness and awareness is so important. But awareness is only half the battle. You know it just gets us started. So. Pre-contemplation is prior to awareness. Sometimes, like for example, if you live in a community where every like or your family is all overweight and that's the norm, then you may not realize it's important. I first realized that, you know, I remember when I moved to California from the East Coast, I discovered that, wow, everybody made me feel overweight because there's so much emphasis in Southern California near the beaches, for example to be uh, thin. And there's also more, there are a lot of health conscious people there. And so, you know, I became very much aware. But prior to that, I would probably say I was in pre-contemplation. So contemplation is when we become aware of something. So uh, we start to realize that, wow, you know, there's a problem in my life or maybe I'm hungry or I need something or I need, uh, I need, uh, people, I need relationships or something like that. And so this is awareness, but awareness is only the beginning. We need to then be mobilized to do something. And you, you may see that this is similar to Gestalt's um, contact cycle or cycle of awareness and fulfilling awareness or fulfilling our needs in a Gestalt cycle. But this is somewhat similar. So we have pre-contemplation and then there's contemplation, which is awareness, but that's not sufficient. Then we need to prepare for change and that involves mobilizing for action, which is similar again to Gestalt's theory. So there's pre preparation phase. And then we act on that. We, we, have, we develop the energy to do something 
for example, if you are addicted to something, addicted to um, alcohol, for example, you may have, at the beginning you might think, eh, it's not an issue. But then you get into an accident or you do something stupid, then you start to become aware that there's a problem. But then you need to actually start planning to do something about it. So sometimes people think for a while about what they're going to do. And so it's preparation. And then finally you need to take uh, action. You need to actually, well not finally, but you need to do something about it. At some point it has to be more than just talk. You need to actually do something to change. And then once you've made the change, then it's a matter of maintenance. Unfortunately, sometimes we relapse or we struggle to maintain it because there's implications and changes in our social circumstances or it may have an effect on our relationships. So sometimes half the battle is maintaining a change. Uh, you know, for example, a lot of people will successfully lose weight, but then they'll gain it back. I mean, you know, so it's not just a matter of dieting. You know, people have to figure out how to change their whole lifestyles, you know, and making it a permanent part of their their life. And so that's why relapse is oftentimes considered a part of the process. You know, uh, a lot of times we'll re- we will relapse. And so rather than shaming people for relapsing, we need to consider that relapse may be just part of the cycle. You know, we will go through, Many people who are trying to quit an addiction will, will go through several cycles of change, or, you know, c- cycles of making change and they're relapsing. And so that's why we start to understand that relapse is just part of the process. And hopefully that relapse gets smaller and smaller and smaller over time, which, you know, that's the ideal. Uh, and But the other thing that we want to do is we want to take away the shame because sometimes when people relapse, they feel so horrible about it that they, they just give up altogether. So when we reframe it as, you know, it's just a small relapse, don't make it a big relapse, okay? Then people can have hope that, you know, just because you might have made a mistake doesn't mean you have to give up and, you know, and get wasted or, um, you know, throw it all out. You know, it just it says you just get back up again and keep going. And that maintenance or that uh, continuation is really what helps people to strengthen their change. So an understanding of how people change helps us to understand that, you know, rather than shaming people for not changing, we need to think about how we can help people to uh, tap into the motivations, what motivates people. So that brings us to the subject of motivational interviewing and how it helps people change. Motivational interviewing is a common counseling method that's used in the addiction field. It's very successful and very effective, and it just taps into motivation. So I want to talk about that next. Motivational interviewing, like I said, is popular in addiction treatment. The principle, uh, the main principle is that everyone has a motivation for something, even if it's not necessarily in the direction we explicitly want. So rather than assuming that people don't have motivation, we do, we do assume that people are motivated. It's just not necessarily for what we want them to. So for example, my college students, oftentimes they don't, you know, they don't feel motivated to do well in school. You know, and, you know, they may utterly lack motivation for school. But I wouldn't say that they don't have any motivation. The reality is they just, they're just not motivated for school. There may be other things that are pressing in their priorities. That could be family problems. You know, a lot of times people are struggling with issues at home. That, those kinds of things take precedence. You know, for example, if you have a loved one who's dying or you're caring for somebody that's going to be a higher priority, you know, and I don't blame them. You know, if, if I have a student who's got a loved one who's dying, you know, I, I would not blame them if they felt like school was the last place they wanted to be, you know. I mean, it's important, but it's not as important as someone whose uh, life is on the line. You know, so there's other things that may be more pressing, you know. Now, there's some things that we, you know, we might want to highlight, you know, like, you know, our priorities, for example, like some students say they want to do well in school, but then they spend a lot of time playing video games or being on their phones. And so you got to wonder, you know, are they really motivated for to be successful? So motivational interviewing is the key in motivation interviewing is highlighting the discrepancies between explicit goals and implicit motives. So that's really, that's really how motivational interviewing works. 
simply just highlighting the, the gap between our explicit goals, what we say we want to do, and our implicit motives, the reality of what we actually spend our time obsessing about or thinking about. So, for example, a student who says they want to do well, but they're always playing games, I might simply highlight the discrepancy, you know, like, well, I don't understand, you know. Um, help me understand, you know, I say, I hear you say you want to do this, but then you don't spend any time studying. You know, <laughs> like, for example, I have students who, you know, say they want to do well in class, but then they're on their phones throughout class. You know, that's an, there's some implicit motives there. You know, what is their motive? Are they interested in somebody they're talking to? Are they interested in succeeding at a game? You know, maybe that's important to them. You know, I'm not going to judge people's motives. I just want to highlight that there is a discrepancy. If you say you want this, but you're doing this, well, there's a discrepancy. That's it. So motivational interview, interviewing is actually pretty accepting. It's not non-judgmental. It's simply just pointing out that, you know, our goals are may, may not be in alignment. And, and that's it. So it's not judging people it's, or shaming people that their motives are not what we want them to be. It's just helping people clarify what is it that they're motivated for. Now, addiction, a lot of clinicians find that addictions often fulfill an underlying need, albeit in a maladaptive way. The maladaptive meaning uh, it's a survival strategy that may not necessarily be working very well. The maladaptive solution oftentimes only reinforces shame and makes people feel worse and thus driving the addiction more. So for example, I've worked with people who use alcohol to help them feel better or you know, maybe they had some trauma and alcohol was the only way that they used to escape from that traumatic pain. Uh, or maybe they used alcohol to help them navigate social settings that were very anxiety provoking. And so it's maladaptive in the sense that it serves a purpose, but it doesn't always do, it doesn't do so well because it ends up creating more problems for the person in the end and it makes them feel worse. But rather than shaming people, what I want to do is try to tap into that need. What is the need for, that they're trying to fulfill? And then we just try to find a way to fulfill that need in a more effective, more adaptive way. Otherwise, if you simply shame people without really getting at the need, you're never going to really address what the need is. You know, like, for example, if someone's lonely and you don't talk about the loneliness, then you're not really scratching where it itches. So to many clinicians, addiction is really just a symptom of deeper motivational and emotional issues. So that's, that's why we have a, a trend now to focus more on what we call emotional sobriety. Now, this may be uh, a term that's more specific to the addiction field, not to the broader psychological field. But it's a term I've seen and I like. I actually read this book called Emotional Sobriety and I my... Um, review of it is in T and Dayton's marketing material. Um, I really liked it and I highly recommend it to people. It's a very comprehensive approach to addiction from a trauma perspective. But basically it says that, you know, addiction is really just a symptom. There oftentimes the deeper issues are pain, psychological pain and trauma that people are trying to escape and avoid or numb. And, uh, and so if you don't treat the, if you try to help people quit an addiction, but you don't treat the underlying emotional process, then you're not really making a lasting change. You know, that's why really we want to get at the underlying deeper issues. Another main thing that drives people oftentimes is our relationships. Many people are not motivated because they don't believe that anyone cares about them. You know, when people know that someone cares about them, they're more likely to be motivated. Quality, our quality of relationships can be perhaps the greatest predictor of motivation. When I was in grad school, we did a research study of, um, you know, looking at factors that contributed to diabetes management, for example. And they looked at relationships like marital satisfaction, uh, nutrition, exercise, and things like that. What do you think would be the greatest predictor of how well or how well people manage their diabetes. Well, you'd think it would be exercise and diet, right? 
but it actually turned out to be relationship satisfaction. Relationship satisfaction was perhaps the greatest predictor of how well people took care of their health. That's because, as I said, when people believe that someone cares about them, they're more likely to be motivated to care for their health. Close loving relationships can motivate people to do extraordinary things as well and to transform lives, not just about our health, but to accomplish things, to do things. You know, when people, um, you know, people are oftentimes motivated by love. You know, we've, there's stories of how love has launched wars, you know, uh, people have engaged in wars and um, lots of extreme things because of love. People, you know, the song is about I would walk one, uh, you know, walk a thousand miles, you know, just to be with you. You know, uh, love will motivate people to do a lot of things, and uh, and so it's a very powerful motivator that you know love is. Many believe that relationship health is the most important part of our overall health because relationships drive our mental health, though mental health can also impact our relationships too. Overall, these aspects drive our overall health and well-being. So, you know, we we talked about relationships and self-actualization. I want to talk a little bit about how, you know, this is seen in the Bible. There's, you know, a passage in the Bible that talks about the will in the Bible. Now, remember, the will is a more ancient concept that, you know, there's something that sits in us that controls our behavior. That was a that was a classic way we understood human behavior in uh, earlier times, and that's how the Bible uh, the Bible writers also tended to see us our motivation as well. So you might recall in the a Bible Romans chapter seven, Paul talks a lot about the struggle with motivation, the struggle he had, you know, and he would say something he had a hard time with his motivation. So this comes from Romans chapter 7, and this is what Paul writes when he wrote about a struggle he had. He says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it but it is sin living in me. So he's basically saying he's a captive to his, uh, you know, his sinful desires in him. And he is not able to live consistently with his explicit motives. You know, there's this gap. You know, he's not able to be consistent. He's not able to accomplish, you know, he's not able to feel truly free, which is what we really want to have. We want, a lot of us want to have a sense of free will, right? We want to know that our will is free. But for him... His will is not free. And for many Christians, we would say, you know, is our will truly free? You know, um, and that's why maybe we don't really talk so much about will anymore. There, is the will truly free? You know, and he would probably agree that it's not. You know, we are under the influence of all kinds of things, our society, our behavioral learning, um, you know, all kinds of things, you know, unconscious needs that we're not even aware of that drive our behavior. He continues, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, uh, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, you know, it has explicit motivations <laughs> to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do. You know, he cannot live consistently with his explicit motives. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. And again, this goes back to our unconscious needs. A lot of Christians have a hard time understanding that sin is, is, you know, like people don't understand that sin is not just some cognitive process. It's roots. The, the roots of sin is really at an unconscious level. Our behavior is oftentimes d- determined by what's going on at an unconscious level. So he says, now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it who do it, but it is a sin living in me that does it. So something, again, sin is, sin starts at an unconscious level. So I find this law at work. All I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, now he would say, yes, I do delight in God's law, 
you know, there is, there's a war within himself. You know, he's got these conflicting motives. You know, on one hand, he does feel a delight in God's law. He wants to do God's law. He wants to do what God expects. But I see another law at work in me, waging a war against the law of my mind, on the unconscious level, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. And, and there he would say, this is, he's a prisoner. This is what addiction really is. And addiction is, you know, putting people in a mental prison where they cannot break away from their habits and hurts. They cannot do what they want to do. That's really what an addiction is. It says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? You know, it's true. Our, when we are trapped in addiction, it's a downward death spiral. We are go- it could kill us. Anytime we're trapped and addicted to something, whether it's a drug or some psychological process, it could harm us, and, and it's really a death spiral. So who will rescue us? Who will rescue me from this body that's subject to death? He says, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is interesting. He, on an emotional, subconscious level, he is a slave to sin. You know, he he's controlled by his unconscious desires, but he can override those unconscious desires by choosing to. Again, we're not a we're not robots. We're not simply predetermined uh, to engage in the behaviors that our our emotions dictate. Rather, our cortical mind, the the higher level reasoning, can take control. If we allow ourselves to be a slave, in a sense, to God, God's leading, you know, God can convict us in our consciences. We can, uh, you know, our super ego. We can. That's different from the unconscious mind. You know, God can convict our convict our conscious and help us to think more consciously at a higher level, so that we can override the sinful nature. But here's the thing. There's now, when we are in Jesus, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So that means even if you were to relapse, you know, there's no condemnation because as long as you are clinging to God and you're staying in that process of change, you don't give up when you relapse. As long as you stay in Jesus, there is no condemnation. You know, that was really hard for me because I I used to be addicted to something in my life. And every time I relapsed, I would feel ashamed and I would beat myself up and I'd feel like I start all over again. And then I felt like I was in and out of salvation. You know, like one minute I was in God's good side, but when I failed and messed up, I was not on God's good side. And that's not a good thing. I would feel like I'm constantly in and out, in and out. And that's just a bad feeling. But then when I realized that, you know what, because Jesus died for me in my sin, that means I can come to him as I am, not when I am perfect or not when I'm ought, how I ought to be. And when I'm in him, I don't have to feel judgment. I don't have to feel ashamed because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is a text, this Romans 8, 1, this is a text that I clung to when I was in my addictions. It's the one text that helped me to focus on something else besides myself. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's, it gets really discouraging when you're navel gazing and focusing on your own self all the time. You start to think that I can't change. There's no hope. But when I have this hope, when I look at somebody else, it gives me the hope that I can change. I don't have to focus on the negativity in life. I can believe that someone can help me get better. And I don't have to be ashamed anymore. And that sets us free. I realized over time, as I focus on God and not myself, that I became free. I didn't have to think about my own sinful behavior, or my unconscious desires. My, I found that my unconscious desires became aligned and became aligned with my e- extrinsic desires or my external, uh, ex- you know, motivations, my explicit motivations. When I when I allowed myself to be transformed by Jesus and allowed His blood to cover me and to not feel ashamed of myself, then I was transformed by his love. 
I no longer wanted to do anything bad because I, I, I felt so loved by God. I didn't need to do anything to win his approval, but that, um, that love transformed me. And so I really believe that relationships is the most powerful motivating force. And when you have a relationship with God, it is, it is powerful. It motivates you to change. Nothing else can do it. If you just try to do it on your sheer, sheer willpower, you may discover that there's unconscious forces at work and it's going to be discouraging. But if you want those unconscious desires to be transformed, that can happen through a relationship with God and by being set free from the shame that comes from when we relapse. And so that was very transforming. And now, today, I don't ha- I have victory, I believe, for the most part. You know, there's going to be times when I relapse, you know, but um, I don't focus on that anymore. I just focus on God, and I've discovered that that no longer has much power in my life anymore. So I hope you can join us as we continue on on this section related to emotions. In our next chapter, following your gut, as we talk more specifically about emotional awareness. Thank you.